great. Well, I'm going to attempt to make life hard on our camera person here by moving around a little bit. I'm not great behind a podium. I like to be out in the open space. It's good to be amongst family here. This is like a family, all of the different interconnections. What an impressive web that TFAS has been able to put together. Thank you for inviting me today. We were talking about journalists just a second ago. I'm going to start with a probably apocryphal story about a journalist. It is said that a journalist once asked the infamous bank robber, Willie Sutton, why it is that he robs banks. And Willie Sutton replied, because that's where the money is. <laughs> now, he wasn't talking about 21st century American capitalism. But if you're following the economic discourse in our country these days, his words sound awfully familiar. You may have seen or heard about an interview that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez gave earlier this week on Monday. And in the course of the interview, the interviewer asked her, okay, let's say I'm Joe Billionaire. I make widgets, and I sell those widgets, and people buy them, and I end up making a billion dollars off of those widgets, and that's my money because I sold them. Why does that make me the enemy? And Ocasio-Cortez summarized her answer by saying this. Maybe you heard her say this. No one ever makes a billion dollars. You take a billion dollars. In other words, Willie Sutton is the face of 21st century American capitalism. Bank robbers and billionaires are just two sides of the same coin. Now, I'm not here today to talk about AOC, but I am here today to talk about a question that's related to what she said. And it's a question I get all the time as an economist, as a university professor. People ask me all the time, why is it that young people seem to be so attracted to socialism? And they'll usually follow up that question which, with another, which is, and why don't you do something about it? And my polite answer to that question is, look, I'm trying. But tonight, I actually want to give you my real answer. And I hope that this answer stirs the pot just a little bit, because I think we need to. I don't think the old answers are working. The truth is, when people ask me, why don't you do something about it? They're asking the wrong guy. Young people are attracted to socialism not because they're hearing compelling economic arguments. Socialism is not winning people's minds. But what is happening is that capitalism is having a very, very hard time holding on to people's hearts. That's the driver. The battle we're in between socialism and capitalism is not being fought over economic arguments. The contested territory is actually the moral imagination of our culture. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is incredibly influential, but do you understand why she's influential? It's not because she's making arguments that are airtight. The reason she has influence is because she is very, very, very good at creating and repackaging and disseminating stories that put capitalism and capitalists in the role of the bad guy. And I'm not saying that the stories are actually all that compelling. And I know in many cases they're flat out not true. 
But think about the response we so often give to the things we hear from someone like AOC. The response often is, your numbers don't add up. The math doesn't work. And that's true. But my point here today is to tell you that if that's the response that we keep giving to the stories she is telling and others are telling, those stories will continue to prevail. Capitalism, capitalism doesn't have to lose the battle of stories that shape our moral imagination. We've got plenty of them. The problem isn't the lack of stories. The problem, I'm going to argue, is a lack of storytellers. We need storytellers who have eyes to see the wonders around us that so many of us have become blind to. That's my thesis. Now, let me tell you why I think that. Let me tell you where this is coming from. So a few years ago, I had a student walk into my office. One of my best students, a very bright student, very ambitious student. She walked into my office, and she wanted some career advice. Her plan was to go into the nonprofit sector, and she wanted to know, okay, so tell me about how I can do that. Well, anytime a student walks into my office for career advice, I always ask the same question. Why do you want to go into that space? Why do you want to go into that job? And so I asked the question to this student of mine, why do you want to do that? And her answer was, well, I want to make a difference in the world. I want to do something good. So I said, okay. And I wasn't trying to be cute here, but I asked her again, so tell me why you want to go work for a nonprofit. And she, she looked at me like, didn't I just answer that question for you? So I said, okay, let's talk about this. Let's talk about your morning this morning. Here we are. What are the things that made a big difference for you in your morning? What has made this a meaningful morning for you? What made it work? And that's actually a deceptively tricky question, isn't it? We don't often think about all the things that make our lives possible. So we sat there and we thought about it. She thought about it. She said, well, I got a paper due today. I was working on it this morning. And if I didn't have my computer, I wouldn't be able to write the paper. I wouldn't be able to do the research. And, you know, I couldn't see a thing if I didn't have these glasses on my head. I guess they're very meaningful for me. And I had a couple cups of coffee this morning to wake up, and I ate a yogurt, and I think that's kind of keeping me going. And so we talked about all of these things. She also mentioned, hey, I wouldn't be at school today if the subway wasn't here. So the subway made a big difference in my day. So we talked about all these things, and as we talked about them, the conclusion she reached, and I helped her a little bit, was all of these things that were so meaningful in your day were produced by companies that actually try to make a profit, with one exception, the subway, which is run by the MTA. <laughs> and you know what's funny? What's really funny is the only one of those things that she listed that kind of let her down that morning <laughs> was the subway, because it was late. So, so she thought about that, and she could chuckle at that. Okay, But here's where it got interesting for me as an educator. She laughed at that, but then she sat back in her chair. And this is a young woman who, she has an answer for everything. She's ambitious. She's energetic. She's never without a word. But she sat back in her chair in my office. And she turned her head and, and, and looked at the wall, I guess, for what felt like an eternity. Probably 30 seconds. And then she looked at me, and she had this look in her eyes that I can only describe it as, like, confused. And she said to me, is it okay if I just want to go into business? And that question really surprised me. I get career advice questions all the time, but they're almost always tactical or strategic. You know, 
if I want to get into this, this space, how do I do it? And if I like this, where should I go work? And what kind of job would be a good fit for me? I get those questions. Strategic, tactical, I get that. Do you notice that's not what she asked me? She asked me a moral question. Is it okay if I just want to go into business? Now I was the one who didn't know what to say because that was a new question for me. And eventually I said this. Why are you asking my permission? And she said, I don't know. And that said everything. So for the, for the next several months and even the, the next year, I had a chance to follow up with her. Like, what's going on here? Why are we talking about this? And I discovered something interesting that I think matters when it comes to why are we in this situation with capitalism and socialism that we're talking about here. So let me give you, let me give you the, let's do a little thought experiment. I think part of what was motivating her thinking and what she was expressing was the effect that storytelling institutions in our culture have had on her moral imagination. Just take one for example, okay? So just take cinema, okay? Let me, let me ask you to consider something. Think about all the movies that you can remember, all the movies that you can call to mind. And I want you to think about the films you've seen where the plain old wealth creating businessman or woman, business owner, is the hero in that film by virtue of the business he or she runs. Now, we don't have all day, we can't sit here and think about this, but if you're like most people and most audiences I talk to, their response is, I don't know. That's kind of tricky. Now, I'll tell you, I do often get two responses. There are two responses I get pretty regularly. I'll tell you what they are. I don't think they work. One of them is Bruce Wayne. And the other one is Tony Stark. And I totally agree that these guys run, they own very successful businesses. But of course, the reasons they're heroes in their story is not by virtue of the businesses they run, but by the things they do outside their business that in some way launders and cleans the business that they run. Those are typically the answers I get to that question. That's interesting. You think how powerful film is, and you think about who is held out to you as the hero and who is not. Now think about another question. Think about films you've seen where the greedy, conniving, autocratic businessman or woman is the villain by virtue of the business he or she runs. Now, you, you may not be able to think about somebody exactly by name or a film exactly by name, but if you're like most people I talk to, the immediate response is, oh, I've seen that character a thousand times. That is stock and trade. When I do get an answer, I, it depends on how old the person is, typically. If somebody is my age or a little bit older, they'll raise their hand and they'll say, oh, Gordon Gecko. Greed is good. Wall Street. If they're a little bit younger, so if I'm talking to my students, one character that often comes up is President Business from the Lego movie. And if you've seen the Lego movie, you know President Business is the embodiment, literally the embodiment of crony capitalism. My kids think he's hilarious. I don't know what they think about business. That's the problem. These are, and look, we're talking about cinema. We're talking about film here, okay? That's in some ways outdated. 
because of course we don't live merely in a world where people go to the movies to watch a story or watch a film. We have now just a multiplicity of platforms multiplying every day where we can tell stories, whether you're talking about streaming services or whether you're talking about user-generated content or whether you're talking about social media. The volume of story in our lives is growing at a rate that none of us can comprehend and the velocity of how that story moves through our lives has never been faster. And it's met with an appetite that's absolutely, it's voracious to consume story. If you ride the subway home tonight, look at the person on your left, look at the person on your right, and you tell me what they're doing. And I'll give you the answer right now. They're consuming story. Story is the force. It's like drops on a rock that shapes how we think about what is good and praiseworthy in our world. Now, does that mean capitalism has to walk away from this with a black eye all the time? No, I don't think so. We don't have to walk away with a black eye because capitalism is full of amazing stories. It generates amazing stories of problems solved, of human flourishing, of opportunity created, of lives extended. It's all over the place. But I'll tell you what I think the problem is. It's not that capitalism doesn't generate the kind of stories that can shape our moral imagination. Here's the problem. Capitalism, free enterprise, has so many heroes, and their effects are so pervasive that they very quickly become very mundane to our eyes. Heroes of capitalism fade into the background oh so quickly. Think about it. You walked into this building today. Did you check your coat in the coat room? When you did, did you high five anyone about how awesome it was that everybody who walked into that coat room had a warm coat on a cold day? that it was so widespread. No, I understand we're at the Harvard Club. <laughs> this isn't, you know, this isn't Cracker Barrel or whatever. Um, but did you, have you ever done that? Have you ever walked in a room and said, hey, guys, let's just take a moment and, and how great is it that we all have coats on right now? Did you, did you walk into this room and say, my gosh, would you look at that? One guy did. <laughs> Utilities guy over here. Now, the truth is, and you know this better than anyone. Nobody walks in and says, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Guys, look at this. Take a picture of me, would you? Nobody does that. <laughs> because it's so mundane. It's just, it's, it's just there. Nobody wa you went to the bathroom before you came in here. Nobody walked into the bathroom and looked at the toilet and said, yes, this is awesome. Not long ago, you would have, actually, in some of our major cities in this country. But we, we don't have that. We don't have that reaction. The villains, get the, the villains get the attention in capitalism, I think, because actually, proportionately, they're so rare. They tend to be big and rare, and so they make for the great stories. But the good guys, the good guys blend into the background. They recede from our view. We become blind to them unless, unless we make an active choice to find them and lift them up. But I think the problem is we don't do enough of that. And it, the problem is amplified in a world where story takes on such a much more important role. Okay? So let me, let me show you what I mean. Let me tell you what I mean about uh, the hidden story and why I think it matters. Okay? So, um, a few years ago, my dad was diagnosed with a pretty serious heart condition. And if you've dealt with anybody in that situation, you know just how traumatic that can be for a family and how worried a family can be, how worried he was. And we were. But we found out from the doctor that he could be treated fairly well, fairly easily by implanting a pacemaker. And the moment we found out that the treatment for his heart problem was a pacemaker, all of that worry just disappeared. Gone. Why? Because everybody knows somebody who has a pacemaker. 
And everybody who knows somebody with a pacemaker knows they're incredibly effective. They work very well. They're very reliable. The procedure is bread and butter. When it comes to the world of medicine, pacemakers are boring. That gave us great hope. But here's, here's what happened that was peculiar for me. In the midst of that relief, in the midst of that relief, I asked myself what felt like a very peculiar question on the one hand, but also one that seemed both natural and simple as well. And that question was, I'm so happy that a pacemaker exists. Where in the world did that come from? And we'd been acting like, my dad needs a pacemaker. Let's go to the pacemaker tree. Let's take one down. Let's put it in. But of course, that's not the story. The actual story of where this thing came from was much, much more interesting and much, much more formative on my moral imagination. The story, this is the pacemaker we're talking about. The story actually starts in a garage in Minnesota with a guy named Earl Bakken. We're back in the late 1940s, and this is a guy who self-described tinker. He loves to work with electronic equipment. So it's usually radios and then early television sets and other things. But he notices after World War II that more and more hospitals are starting to use electronic equipment to treat patients. So he goes to the University of Minnesota Hospital and he says, hey, can I help you out with this stuff? And they say, sure. OK, great. So Earl Bakken is wandering the hallways of the University of Minnesota, and he's doing so at the same time that there is a surgeon there who is doing path-breaking operations on children with heart defects. This is a guy who's been on the cover of Time magazine, really, really famous, really amazing work. So this, this surgeon is doing these path-breaking uh, surgeries on children. And here's the catch, okay? It's amazing work. It's amazing stuff. When he finishes the surgery, the children have to go into recovery. And one of the things they need for recovery is to be hooked up to a pacemaker, okay? Remember, we're talking about 70 years ago. Do you know what a pacemaker looked like 70 years ago? It's, it's not the thing, it's not the thing that I just showed you. So here's a surgeon, here's the children that he's working on. He's saving their lives in a way nobody has been able to before. But in order for them to recover, they have to be hooked up to a pacemaker. That's what a pacemaker looked like 70 years ago. The size of a microwave, just as heavy, just as immobile. You have to set it on a cart next to the patient's bed in order for them to be hooked up to it. Now that's inconvenient, but there's a really bad part. Do you know what the worst part is of a pacemaker like this? Can you see it? Can you guess? What do you think it is? Well, you can't take a shower, that's bad. That's inconvenient. You got it. It has to be plugged in. Do you see a potential problem with that? So Halloween night, 1957, University of Minnesota Hospital. Power goes out. Backup generator in the recovery rooms doesn't kick in. Surgeon has a child who needs the pacemaker. It can't function. She needs it. And you know the rest of the story. He had just saved her life and she died because of a power outage. So the surgeon goes to the physics department at the University of Minnesota and says, hey, can you, can you help me fix this? I've got a problem, I need somebody to fix it. You seem like the people who could do this. They can't figure anything out. But he also knows Earl Bakken, the guy wandering the hallways. And so he says to Earl, this is my problem, these are the features. Can you fix this? Can you do something? Earl goes back to that garage that I showed you, and four weeks later, he comes back with a battery-powered pacemaker the size of a few decks of cards that a child can wear around his or her neck and that will never lose power because of a power outage. Four weeks later, he comes back with that. 
That was the beginning of a company that you may have heard of called Medtronic, a company that's worth tens of billions of dollars now, not just by making pacemakers, but by making devices for all different applications in the body, ear, nose, throat, spine, et cetera, et cetera. Medtronic grew and served tens of thousands of people. And as a result of that, Earl Bakken, Earl Bakken ended up becoming a billionaire. I was thinking about Earl. This, by the way, is there's the pacemaker. That's the innovation. That's the surgeon. That's just how different it was. So I was thinking about, as I was reflecting back on Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's comments in her interview this week, where she talked about, you don't, no one ever makes a billion dollars. You take a billion dollars. I was reflecting on that, and I was thinking about Earl Bakken. And I'll tell you what I felt. My first reaction to that was, how dare you put him in a bucket of widget-making billionaires who take and don't make? My first reaction is, how dare you do that? What an injustice to lump him into that group, given all of the contributions his products have made to people's lives, including my dad's. How dare you do that? But, but this was, this is the insight that I think matters for the purpose of this talk. My first reaction is to say, how dare you? My second reaction was to say, she's probably never even heard of Earl Bakken. Just like you just like most people. How can Earl Bakken's story shape your moral imagination about capitalism when you've never even heard it? We should be telling his story and thousands of stories like it all of the time. We have to tell those stories all the time because if you don't, those stories recede into the background and New stories never get written. That's the threat. So I, I think about that opening question. Who's the right guy to ask the question? What do we do about capitalism and socialism? And I'd like to think it would be me. I'd like to think I'm on the front lines. And I am in some ways. I do have an opportunity to talk about this. But the truth is, the folks who are really on the front lines of the conversation that has to happen are you. In journalism, in media, in the marketplace, running and working for companies that have stories to tell about good being done, you're in the position to change the stories we tell and so change people's moral imagination. But I want you to see that it requires having eyes to see things that we are normally blind to in our complacency. I think G.K. Chesterton puts it best. He's not talking economics, but I think he's exactly right. He said, we're perishing not for want of wonders, but want of wonder. I think his challenge to us is there's a story to be told. You're in a position to tell it. So what are you going to do about it? Thanks very much for hearing the talk. Look forward to Q&A just a little bit later. I'm an economist, and uh, I spend a lot of time talking about trade. President Trump's been very good for my career. Uh, and I'm passionate about trade. This is actually my license plate <laughs> on my foreign-made car in, in, in Virginia. I've had it for quite some time. So I feel very passionate about trade. And I, I want people to understand trade and to accept why free trade is uh, both an ethical and an economically uh, uh, sound position, the best position indeed. And so... I go back and forth. I have a whole bunch of stories to tell about, about trade. These stories involve uh, 
uh, uh, Krispy Kreme donuts. They involve, actually involve a doctor. They, they involve Dr. Jonas Salk. I tell stories and people say, oh, those are just anecdotes. You're just telling stories. We need hard data. Okay. I can present hard data. So in, in thinking about this talk, I'm thinking, how should I go? Stories or data? So guess what I chose? Data. <laughs> so, it sounds boring, right? Um, but it's the story. That's my true story. Uh, so I just want to share with you uh, some data on, on trade, uh, data designed to uh, debunk a lot of stories that are often told. Stories told by politicians, stories told by pundits, stories told by people in the, in the, in, 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 in the media, uh, stories told by a lot of my fellow academics. These, sto these stories are all wrong. So there are a lot of fears about trade. You've heard them all. Um, certainly you've heard the, the, the main ones. And the, the main story, the main fear that people have about trade, it's a story, is that Free trade, imports, cost jobs. This is the overwhelming fear that people have about trade. And you get it, right? So if Americans buy more steel from China, right? well, that, that means Americans get inexpensive steel, but at the cost of Americans losing jobs in Pittsburgh and in Ohio and in California and in Alabama where they make a lot of steel. And so jobs go down. So we can't have free trade, or at least we have to weigh the job losses against the gains in terms of lower-priced steel. That's a story. Economists have a, a, a counter story. This, this story is so abstract, it's really a theory. But economists say, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Think about that. If it's true, when we buy more steel from China, that does reduce the number of jobs in American steel plants. But why do the Chinese sell us their steel? They sell us their steel because they're really fond of dead American statesmen and can't get enough monochrome portraits of them. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, you know the list, right? Now, that's not right. They, they, the Chinese, they, they, look, they're just like us. They accept money, but they're like you and me. They accept money because money can be spent. Well, where can you spend dollars? You can spend dollars in the United States. You can invest dollars in the United States. You can't really do it in China. You can convert the dollars into Chinese yuan, but the person who gives you Chinese yuan in China for U.S. dollars will give you those yuan only because that person wants to spend or invest, or that person's customer wants to spend or invest in the United States. The story that economists tell us, you can trace it out as long as you want. When foreigners sell us stuff, they do it only because they either want to buy our exports, which is good, and that creates jobs, or they want to invest in America, which is even better, and it also creates jobs. And so if you look at the whole story, I, I didn't plan to say story as much tonight until I heard <laughs> your talk. If you look at the whole story, economists say there's no reason to think that trade destroys jobs, even though that story is constantly told by protectionists uh, uh, left and, uh, and right. Uh, so let's look at some data. Um, actually, let's, before I do that, um, this is from Donald Trump's uh, March 1990 Playboy <laughs> interview. Uh, this is <laughs> the Japanese double screw the US, a real trick. First, they take all our money with their consumer goods. How's that for a story? Right? You're walking along one day, and some Japanese person springs out and foists a Camry on you and takes your money against your will. Right? Right? And then they put it back in buying up all of Manhattan. All. Right? So either way, we lose. Right? In fact, the Japanese are so evil, right? they, they take all that money, and, and, and then they, they pay more for Manhattan than it's worth. Right? I want someone to pay me more than for something. I want someone to buy everything I own, offer me every, for everything I own, something more than it's worth. I have a watch. You want to pay me more than what it's worth? I have a house. Pay me a billion dollars. It's not worth that. Anyway, that, that's a story people tell. Um, uh, and another story that, that, that by the way, if, uh, it's only because Donald Trump is president now and he's particularly vocal on trade. If I'd given this lecture five years ago, I'd have Obama. Uh, Hillary Clinton had won in 20. 16, I would have Hillary Clinton. You can get these, these similar statements uh, all of it. In fact, one thing about President Trump is that he's at least a, 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 bit, a bit more honest and direct about, about what, what he says. So one of the stories that people tell about trade is that it's a contest, right? Uh, uh, we don't beat China in trade, right? We don't beat Mexico on trade. It's like 
it's like uh, you know the two football teams going at at each other. It's a contest, and and if one always wins, uh, then the other's going to always lose. Uh, this story of trade being a contest between countries is pernicious, and it's 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 wrong. Um, uh, trade between countries is no more contest than you trading with your supermarket is a contest. Uh, you both gain, and that's how that's exactly. The same thing with, with, with trade. But what President Trump means, as you probably know if you pay attention to the news, um, that last phrase, by the way, was, is a tick. I normally teach 18-year-olds, so I have to say, if you pay attention to the news, because they don't pay attention to the news. You do, right? So forgive me. Um, uh, it, President Trump is obsessed with the trade deficit. So let me ask you, this is a, kind of a biased audience, but how many of you actually know what, you've, you've all heard of it. Would, it you, could, could any, would anyone be brave enough? I'm not going to really ask you to do it. But, but if I would, would anybody be brave enough to stand up and define what the trade deficit is? You hear about the trade deficit all the time. I'm telling you as an economist, I have a PhD, so you have to take my word for it. Right? I'm telling you, right? people who talk, who talk about the trade deficit, 98% of them have no earthly idea what it is. It sounds bad. Deficit's bad. Right? President Trump doesn't know what it is. Uh, uh, he, 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 th I'm not exaggerating. Not, 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 uh, uh, it's not... It's literally, he literally doesn't know what it is. Uh, so let's look at, see, I told you, data, right? So let's look at, 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 at data. These are some, all the data that I'm going to show you uh, uh, come from uh, government sources, most from the St. Louis uh, uh, Fed, so Fred database. It's very popular among, among economists and a few others, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So the first thing I want to show you is that the story that people tell about trade often implies that there's a fixed number of jobs in the world. And so if we lose a job to China, then we're down one net job. China gets one job, we're down one net job, and the total number of jobs in the world is fixed. The total number of jobs is not fixed. This, what this shows, the green line is the US labor force. This is the number of American and civilian labor force, number of American adults between 16 and 65 who are either working or who, who want to work. Right? So it doesn't count retirees. It, it doesn't count uh, infant babies. It doesn't count full-time students. It counts people who are working or who want to work. The yellow line is the actual number of full-time jobs in the American economy from 1950 through 2017. And what you can see is that the number of jobs tracks the number of people who want jobs. The difference, the vertical distance between those two lines is the unemployment rate. So it expands a little bit during recessions. Uh, so clearly, there's not a fixed number of jobs in the United States. The Labor, the labor force grew by about 150% um, uh, uh, over the course of, of uh, those fi uh, 67 years. And so too did the, um, uh, uh, actually more than that, uh, almost tripled, uh, so too did the number of jobs. So there's not a fixed number of jobs. That's one story that you hear or an implicit premise of the story that you hear that's not true. Um, so more data. The yellow line is the line I showed you earlier. That's the number of jobs, the US civilian, et cetera, full-time civilian employment. And the green line is US exports, measured in dollar terms and, and, and adjusted for inflation. And what we can see here is that the number of jobs kept going steadily up. So imports rose gradually. But starting in the late 70s, they took a significant increase up in, in, in the rate at which they grew has absolutely no effect on the number of jobs. So this notion that the more we import, the more jobs we lose is simply mistaken. You can't find it in the data. But I remind you, economists have a story for why that's so, because the Chinese don't sell us stuff because they like dead American statesmen. They sell us stuff because they want to either buy stuff from us or invest in our economy, which is, which is what they do with the dollars. They do the same thing with their dollars as you do with your dollars. So uh, imports have no effect on job growth. What about the trade deficit? The green line is the US trade deficit, because the trade deficit is a negative figure. By the way, narrowing it, simplifying just a little bit, the trade deficit is just the excess during some period of the amount of imports Americans buy in total over the amount of exports we sell in total. So if we ex uh, import more than we export, we run a trade deficit. It seems bad, it's not. Uh, no concept in all of economics is responsible for more mischief than the notion of the trade deficit. I, I, I wish there were no statistics ever gathered on the trade deficit. Anyway, as you can see, for a variety of reasons, starting in 1976, the United States began to run a, a consistent trade deficit. 
This is the job line that I showed you earlier. Absolutely zero effect on the number of jobs. So the trade deficit goes significantly high. The trade deficit is much higher than it was in the 1970s and before, and no effect on job growth at all, despite the constant stories that you're hearing in the press uh, and from politicians to the contrary. What about on, on compensation, worker pay? The yellow line is worker real compensation. And by the way, that yellow line does not include the value of, of what I call formal fringe benefits. It's just looking at wage pay or salary pay uh, adjusted for inflation. And, 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 and the, the portion of fringe benefits uh, in Americans' paychecks has, has, has gone up. In 1975, typical American worker got about 10% of his or her pay in the form of fringe benefits. Today, it's about 19%. Um, anyway, so pay goes up steadily. Again, adjusted for inflation. Here's the trade deficit. Trade deficit has no effect on the total pay of workers. It doesn't, it doesn't cause workers' pay to decline. Uh, uh, it doesn't cause the total number of jobs to decline or the amount of unemployment to rise. Uh, this is, again, compensation now just plotted against imports. So as imports go up, no effect on pay. We saw earlier imports have no effect on the number of jobs. Again, despite what you, despite what you hear, a, a story that's told as if it is a settled fact. Well, of course, when the trade deficit rises, we suffer job losses or we suffer declines in compensation. Let me bust some other myths using, using data. So we're, 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 we're often, you hear about a story that's often told is the hollowing out of American manufacturing. We don't make things anymore. President Trump said that several times during the, 19, uh, during the 2016 campaign. This is uh, it measured in inflation-adjusted dollars from 1972 through the middle of last year. This is US manufacturing output. And as you can see, it is now near an all-time high. It hit an all-time high just before the Great Recession. Obviously, the Great Recession caused it to fall, and it's been going, uh, ticking back up since. It's ticked back down a little bit since President Trump started his trade war. I don't think that's a coincidence, but I don't have time to get into the story for why that's the case. Now, so, Amer so it's simply false. False to say that we don't make things anymore. Uh, what we don't make are things that are found in Target and Walmart. We don't make final consumer goods. Final consumer goods, uh, uh, it, where a, 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 a consumer good is finally assembled, where a good is finally assembled, that's what gets the made in label. Uh, Americans, because we're so highly productive as a workforce and as an economy, we make a lot of the back end stuff. We make a lot of the software, a lot of the machines that turn out the inputs that get assembled into the, the toasters and the coffee makers that you buy at, at, at Target. And so those labels say, you know, made in Korea or, or made in Indonesia, whereas a lot of the inputs and a lot of the processes for making those things actually come from American workers and are made in the United States. Uh, uh, Dan Eikenson at the Cato Institute um, wrote a nice article a number of years ago. He said, you know, these made in labels, they're, they're, they're actually, they really are highly misleading. Today, in our, in our globalized world today, the only accurate label would read made on earth. It's true. I mean, because ev every, everything, everything that we consume is made with inputs and, 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 and work effort from, from many, many countries. Uh, it's about, be almost impossible. I don't know, maybe ceramic, some ceramic thing to find something made um, uh, in, in, in the place where the label says it's made. So, but no matter how it's measured, our manufacturing output is, is, is still quite high. What about manufacturing capacity? You'll hear, pe you'll hear people say, well, yes, but if we, if we buy more from foreigners, then our industrial capacity will shrink, and that's going to hurt our ability to defend, to defend ourselves nationally. Uh, we're losing our industrial capacity. This is a measure of industrial capacity that the government has used uh, since about the, uh, 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 just after World War II. This goes back to the, uh, sometime in the mid-'60s. This measures industrial capacity, again, in inflation-adjusted terms. It today is at an all-time high. U.S. industrial capacity today is at an all-time high. We're not hollowed out as an economy. What about Americans' wealth? Oh, we Americans are spendthrifts. Um, uh, we're, we're selling all of our assets to foreigners. This is the value of non-financial, I actually have nothing against financial corporations. I just think the world of finance is amazingly productive, uh, uh, and, and I applaud it. I'm happy for it. But 
let's exclude finance. So let's exclude the banks, let's exclude the insurance companies and look at manufacturing plants and, 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 and non-financial companies. Uh, the net worth, the net worth of American, um, uh, of, of non-financial corporate businesses in the United States today is at an all-time high. Well, maybe some might say that's because foreigners own it all. Um, this is the, uh, the net worth of households and nonprofits. Now, this is not in inflation-adjusted terms. I don't know why they don't do it in inflation-adjusted terms. I have in adjusted it for inflation, and it looks like this. Uh, it's a little bit lower, but the net worth of households and nonprofits, for a variety of technolo technical reasons, they in in include nonprofits. Those are actually a very tiny fraction of household wealth. Net household worth in the United States today, these are American households or, or people living in America, is today at an all-time high. Americans are not, are not, we haven't sold our, all of our assets, haven't sold our souls to the Chinese or to anyone else. Um, so uh, over the years, real imports uh, have gone up, real exports have gone up. It's another story economists like to tell it. Imports and exports are connected to each other. If foreigners can't sell us things, they have no dollars to use to buy things from us. Uh, it's astonishing, the stories that some of these people tell. They want, they love exports. Oh, yeah, export's good, right? But, but we don't like imports. And, and then the economist says, well, how are foreigners going to get dollars to buy our exports if we don't buy their imports? Crickets. There's no answer to that question. Um, the, I mentioned the trade deficit. The, the trade deficit, uh, uh, <laughs> stories are important because stories are words, and, and words matter. And the trade deficit is, an, is a terribly named concept. Again, I wish the concept didn't even exist, but given that we have the concept, uh, even that we have the concept, uh, know this. This thing called the trade deficit, if you want to be really technical, because I'm being recorded, maybe the, the current account deficit, if you get really technical, the trade deficit is close enough. The, the, the trade deficit, it has an opposite accounting counterpart. It's called the capital account. And whenever the U.S. trade deficit rises, goes up, we have a higher deficit, the U.S. capital account surplus goes up. The term capital account surplus is a synonym for trade deficit. But you can't demagogue capital account surplus. If, if some news reporter said, well, news out today from the Commerce Department, America's capital account surplus rose, people wouldn't panic. People wouldn't think, oh, this is terrible. What are we going to do? Let's elect someone different to, in, into political office. Capital account surplus sounds good. When Americans run a trade deficit, you know what that means? That means that foreigners, they get these dollars, and they say, you know, rather than spending them all buying American exports, America provides such a, 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 a promising place for these investments compared to other uses of the dollars, compared to investments elsewhere. I want to invest in America. So I'll end with this, because Roger says my time is running out. He sent me this story. I'll have, so I, when I tell this to my students, I, I, I tell them this story, because I, I, I teach this stuff to my, to my students. So, you know, I said, why should we be upset when the trade deficit rises? Because all that means is that foreigners want to invest more in America. Why are we upset at that fact? And I try to drive it home. I, I pick one of my students. I'll pick you. You're young. Tell me your name. You, you, OK. And so you're walking around. You're walking down the street one day, and you run into Jeff Bezos. Right? And you, you, st you strike up a conversation with Jeff Bezos. Right? And he says, you know, you look a, you're a promising young guy. I really think you have a bright future. I'd, I'd like to invest in you. I'd like to just like, lend you a lot of money at a really good rate. Right? Would you, A, be proud of yourself and overjoyed? Or would you, B, be despondent and think, you know, call your parents and say, what's wrong with me? <laughs> Some businessman wanted to invest in me. What, I, I must change the way I'm living. Well, you'd be pleased. I mean, you may, for a variety of reasons, you may or may not take him up in the offer. But clearly, it would be a signal that you're doing something right, right. It's the same thing with foreigners investing in the United States. When they use their dollars to invest here, that causes the U.S. trade deficit to rise. But we shouldn't be upset at that. We should be proud of that fact. Why people are not proud, why Americans are not proud of the fact that we run trade deficits is beyond me. And that's my story for tonight. Thank you very much.
questions for both of them or either of them uh, would be great. Uh, if you want Don to tell his donut story, I'm sure he would. Oh yeah. So uh, anyone, uh, Herb. And please say your name. If you Herb Stop Class of. Yeah. Uh, class of. There you go. 1970. Believe it or not. Um, question for Dr. Boudreau is: sh Is it a good thing if President Trump succeeds? in bringing down tariffs imposed by other economies? Uh, y y yes, of course. A, 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 the freer the trade in the world, the better. Uh, but implicit in your question, I gather, is uh, this is President Trump's goal. Right? Uh, everything, President, everything Donald Trump has said about trade, and I've, I've followed him for a long time and read his stuff, uh, he does not understand trade. Some of his apologists, and sometimes he, will say, oh, my goal is to, is to lower tariffs. But I don't believe him. Uh, he, 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 he truly believes that imports into America are bad, exports are good. He doesn't like it when Americans run trade deficits. He believes that means we're losing. And so if, he met, if by some miracle, tariffs around the world fell, uh, here's what I predict would happen. Uh, it's an easy prediction because tariffs around the world are not going to fall, so I can make it safely. Um, America's trade deficit would rise even further because America would become an especially attractive place to invest. President Trump would look at that and say, oh, this policy is not working. We're losing even more. And so he would then threaten to, to put tariffs back on until other countries take steps to lower the trade deficit. He thinks the trade deficit is a bad thing. And as long as he's operating with that myth, then uh, uh, I, he, 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 in fact, will not be satisfied with the, the, the outcome of, why, of what I believe would be the good thing of, tr of, of trade barriers declining worldwide. I, I was going to ask a question of Brian. Uh, you use the word regularly in your talk, the word capitalism. Yes. Do you think that part of the problem is that word capitalism takes such a negative connotation that we should find another word to describe the free enterprise <laughs> system? <laughs> Well, uh, it was Professor Boudreau who said words matter and words do matter. And I do think capitalism is a pretty <clears throat> damaged word. I also think it's actually a terrible description of what happens in a, in a free market economy. The driving force, as I'm sure you know, and you can agree, the driving force in a capitalist or free market economy is not primarily capital, which nobody really knows what that is anyway, unless you're a professional economist, in which case you also know what the current account deficit is. That's not how we talk. The primary driver, of course, is human ideas that manifest through investments in capital and other things. And so I, I, I do like talking about capitalism differently. It is kind of the word that we use. But my, my point is, and I think this is very consistent with what uh, uh, Dr. Boudreaux said, uh, my point is, it, any of these things, if you really want to make a dent with any of these things, you have to find ways to talk about them in human terms. Capitalism is not a human term. Current account deficit is just a bad measure to, to, to keep. It's also not human. I mean, it just isn't. And so as a result, it doesn't move. I think the reason President Trump has so much success, and I agree, I think his, his thinking on the, the current account deficit and trade deficits it's not quite right, but uh, the the fact is that he can encode his thinking on that in language that people understand and can relate to. I don't think it's if you're somebody who says the current account deficit or the trade deficit is a bad measure of our the healthiness of our trade. I think you're at a disadvantage to find language that's better than that. It's hard to do that, but I don't think that absolves you from it because otherwise the result is people who do find more human language are the ones who tend to hold more sway. So yes, I, I don't know if you want to add anything to that or disagree with that at all. No, I'll only say that the one of my favorite economists today is, is Deirdre McCloskey, who's an, who's an economic historian in Chicago. And uh, she doesn't like the term capitalism a, at all. Uh, she proposes the term innovism, which may be better, but th the, the, the problem with language, it has, it, it, it has a, a kind of stickiness. And, and I agree with you. I think capitalism is kind of a tainted term. Accumulating capital is not what caused our wealth to rise. 
Capital goes to where there are good ideas that can be implemented. So if you have good ideas that can be implemented, it'll find capital. Capital's not the constraint. It's the good ideas and the ability to, to, to make them work. But finding a new term, I find it difficult. I, 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 I myself try to sometimes avoid using the term, but you know, if you talk, if, if I go around, if we go around saying innovism or some other made up terms, people look at us like we're, we're, we're dumb and we would be because we're not talking to people. Dr. Boudreau, what do you make of Ben Bernanke's argument that global imbalances were at least partially responsible for the financial crisis and recession? Not much. Um, Bernanke, Bernanke himself, not long before the recession, uh, was very eloquent in explaining why trade balances are nothing to worry about, pretty much in the same terms that I used up here. Um, I, it's, it's been a long time since I've actually looked, read what Bernanke said, so I don't, I don't, I forget the nuances, and I'm sure there were some that were there. So I don't want to comment too, too much on it. Um, uh, this is one of these things. Where if you have 100 economists, you'll have 102 opinions about what caused the financial crisis, uh, and I, and that's not my specialty. So I won't say. I, I, I'll say that I, I would point some of the finger at the Fed being too loose with the money supply from the 2001 uh, uh, dot-com crash up through uh, the, the Great Recession. I think it was trying to boost, up, boost the economy a little bit, and I think that came back to bite it. And then there was some, a, whole, a whole host of other, uh, it was like a perfect storm of other, of other problems brewing. But I don't, I, I don't think it was global imbalances as such that caused it. Hey, um, Wes Parnell here, uh, Daily News. Um, I, I'm on the streets a lot uh, for my job, and I mean, even today on the bus, to, to your point, I was on the bus today, and the guy was saying, uh, man, you know, it's, it's so, rid and this was in a low-income neighborhood in the Bronx, he was, he was telling someone, he was saying, you know, it's ridiculous how people are poor today. You know, I'm going to my night job, I get my day job, I go to my night job, I can be naked there, I'm a security guard, no one cares, it's so easy to make money now, you just have to be willing to. Um, and that struck me, it was like, this guy is really willing to work, and he says there's, there's a surplus of jobs available if you have the right mindset. Um, but I think that if I were to say, hey, that's capitalism, he would say, no, nah, man, like capitalism's destroying the world. Um, so I, I do think there's there's some validity in like the words that we use. Um, but I also come from Gastonia, North Carolina, an old mill town in the south, where a lot of the jobs have disappeared, and people there really resent it. And I think there's a lot of stories, especially in the immigrant community, about how the economy kind of went back for a bit. Um, but a lot of these people don't really care to hear stories about, oh, just wait for the, you know, things to change or people to come up with better ideas, you know. Their, their despair is very real and it's immediate, and I think that's why they're very passionate about electing people like Trump who said, you know, we need to get the jobs back and, and beat the trade deficit. So how, how do you kind of combat that when people's realities are very severe and immediate? Yeah, I can, I, I, we'll probably take different, have um, different angles on this answer. I come from a similar area in Minnesota, which had similar dynamics in terms of changing industry and changing employment and the effects that had on people. So at a certain level, I'm really sympathetic to those feelings. And I, uh, at a, you know, even as I can agree with Dr. Boudreau on the economics of trade, I can still look at the the ways we've responded to areas of the country where the dislocation has really happened and say uh, mere faith in economics or free market economics has not served the folks there on the ground. It's kept us, I think, from understanding that dislocation requires human investment of time and energy and presence to actually make a difference in people's lives. I guess I would put it this way. I, I'm big on the power of story. I think we should tell more stories in part because I think it shapes how people think about the broader system we live in. But I also think telling more stories gives people more ideas about places they could go and things they could do. I would like us to tell more stories about things that have been happening in Detroit over the past several years, because I think there's been something of a renaissance of sorts in the business community there. I want to know all of those stories so that they might give me an idea about how I can 
go to North Carolina or how I can go to the Iron Range in Minnesota and make an investment that changes people's lives as well. So I'm, I'm sympathetic to it, and I guess my, my initial response is to think more at a local investment level and looking for the stories that inspire others to want to do that, even as I think there's a broader macro story that kind of works out in the aggregate, but definitely doesn't always work out for the particular individuals involved. Yeah, I, I, I won't add too much to that except to say, say two things. Um, and again, this is where data do come in handy. If you look at actually, actually the data, the, 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 the accounts that we have of, of local areas being uh, de devastated, they're overblown. It, it happens, but it's not, it, it isn't the, the scorched earth, you know, middle America is wiped out. Uh, uh, that, that's just not a fact. Uh, you can't find it in the data. You can't even find it in, in, in middle America. You can find isolated pockets. Of course, but that is that's one of the benefits of looking at the larger larger story. The second one is to the extent that um, people do have trouble moving. I would not point. I would point the finger not at economic change, which, which is what the complaint is about, right? Oh, if we have economic change. That means that these people they can no longer do their jobs. I point out one thing about that. Number one, trade, international trade, is a in the United States a relatively minor form of of, of economic change. Here's here's a, here's a statistic that I wonder if you know. Yeah, so. Uh, trade with China uh, is, by, by the largest estimate, uh, the largest r respectable estimate, since China entered the WTO in, tw in 2001 through, uh, I think it's 2017 or 2018, you say it ago, the, 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 the estimate of, the, the largest possible estimate of jobs lost to trade with China is 2.4 million over the course of the those you know dozen and a half or so years, 2.4 million jobs. Do you know the number of jobs that Americans have lost every month on average for the past 10 years? And by, by lost, I mean people who were fired, people who lost jobs because they were laid off or because their, their companies uh, uh, went out of business or, or downsized. Involuntary displacements, as the Bureau of Labor Statistics calls them. I went and look at, looked at these statistics not long ago. On average, each month, the, the number of Americans who, who lose jobs involuntarily is 1.7 million. Uh, 1.7 million. So in less than two months, the, the ordinary job churn in America destroys more, much, many more jobs than the largest estimate of trade with China. Here's one thing I'd like, here's a story I would like to, to be changed, or, or at least wording that I would like to see changed. I, I don't know if anybody has any influence. You, you guys are with the Wall Street Journal. Maybe you can start working on this, right? <laughs> Right. First Friday of every month, you, you all hear it. The, 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 the Commerce Department comes out with the job figures, right? And typically it'll be, you know, uh, 130,000 jobs uh, were created last month, right? Uh, if it's a recession, it's negative. But usually about 130,000, you'll get some opinion. Well, this is a little bit higher than economists expected, or a little bit lower. I don't know who these economists are who have these expectations, but. You don't get it most but, often. But, but no, I don't. <laughs> but, but, but these are the numbers you hear. That, that is a highly misleading report. That is a net number, right? So, so in the typical month, it might be 1.75 million jobs are destroyed uh, or, or created, whereas we're 1.7 uh, 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 two jobs or three jobs are, are destroyed, uh, and with the net being the number you hear reported. The amount of job churn we have in the American economy is enormous, and we don't see it. Uh, we don't tell the stories about it. It, it's so it, it's so regular, and most of these people find jobs. We take it for granted. We just don't see it. Um, but it's easy to film the person in Gastonia. My son went to college in High Point, uh, North North, which is kind of a devastated place. Um, you can film that, and these, these are poignant. I, I, I do not make light of the suffering that anyone who loses a job experiences. But they, but the, the, losing a job to an import from China is just as bad, not worse, not better, just as bad as, now we'll get to the donut story, losing a job to the Atkins diet. About 20 years ago, Krispy Kreme Donuts shut down several dozen of its stores, and it, it, it said the reason is because of the, probably correct, the Atkins diet. Right? When people are switching their diets from carbohydrates into proteins, they buy fewer donuts. So with the Atkins diet, people, you know, butchers, and 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 uh, uh, and bakers, uh, butchers got jobs. Brewers and bakers lost jobs. That's just part of the natural job. It had nothing to do with 
with, with trade. That's my donut story. <laughs>